Well, howdy. Hello. How are you? Going to start tonight with a mild apology, not a full-blown apology, but thanks very much, Goblin Wizard. I can always count on you to steer me in the correct direction. I don't want any super organics coming after me. I'll retract a little bit, half-heartedly, my, uh, my slur last night. I don't like the films, but the books are all right. I'm sorry if I offended you. Anyway, let's get on with our next part of Drowned Wednesday. Oh, I forgot what book we were reading then. Of Drowned Wednesday by Garth Nix. Book three, of course, of the Keys to the Kingdom series. So, I will warn you now. I can feel the first sore throat of the year coming on. So if halfway through this story, I either lose my voice or you hear it getting a little bit pinched. That's why. Okay, so I'll apologise in advance, but I hope I can get through it. I think we've got 13 pages tonight. Normally it's about 10 or 11, so a bit longer, but not too much longer. Are you ready? Are you settled in? Are you cool? Are you calm? Ready for bed? Let's get going. Leaf was sitting slumped in a narrow space with an inch or so of water around her legs. Arthur was looking at her through that mirror, wasn't he, remember? And he saw that she was a prisoner. A heavy chain joined the manacles on her wrists to the manacles on her ankles, then ran to a dark iron ring set into the wooden wall. From the way the water gently sloshed from side to side, she was clearly aboard a ship. The only light came from a swinging, smoke-grind lantern that hung from a hook in the planked ceiling, barely a foot above Leaf's head. So why is the mantis got Leaf shackled up like this? Is that what they were going to do to Arthur? So Drowned Wednesday is already after Arthur, because if you remember in the prologue, Drowned Wednesday's speaker, I can't remember whether it was morning, noon or night, um, came and said to the ship to go and find this person. So, and that was with an invitation? Maybe they've chained her up because they realise she's not the right person. I don't know, let's read on. Something moved in the darkness in the corner of the vision. Arthur shifted his head to try and see it, but that didn't work. The mirror was like a TV set or a stage. Anything that happened to either side or behind it was invisible. The movement came again. Leaf raised her head and looked around. Seeing nothing, her head slumped forward. It looked like she was totally despondent, till Arthur noticed that she was doing something to the manacle on her left ankle. Trying to pick it, he guessed catching a glimpse of a nail file or something similar. Arthur was concentrating so hard on what Light Leaf was doing to the manacle that it took him a moment for him to realise he'd seen movement again. This time, the movement ended within the mirror's frame and Arthur had a clear look at what it was. A rat. But not just any old rat. This was a four-foot-tall brown-haired rat that stood upright on its hind legs. It was also wearing clothes. It had on an old but well-kept sallow-tailed coat of dark blue with gold facings over a cream shirt and silver waistcoat with white breeches that were rolled up to be out of the sloshing water. Its feet were bare and its pink, hairless tail flicked around behind. The rat lifted its broad-brimmed but low-crowned hat of oiled leather and said in a voice that squeaked when it took in a breath, Excuse me, miss. Are you by any chance a mortal from Earth? Well, he didn't talk too much in this story. <laughs> Leaf started and scuttled back, her chains rattling. I beg your pardon, said the rat. I didn't mean to startle you. I would not intrude, save that I have a commission regarding a mortal from Earth. Leaf shook her head and blinked a few times. Sorry, she said. I just kind of wasn't expecting a, a visitor. Allow me to introduce myself, said the rat. I am <coughs> I am Commodore Mockton, officer in charge of the raised rats of the Border Sea. Raised rats, said Leaf weakly. Border Sea? Commodore Mo Monkton's whiskers twitched before he answered. The raised rats, young lady, are those rats that formerly served the piper and were brought by him to the house. The Border Sea is a domain of the house notionally ruled over by Lady Wednesday. <laughs> Self-styled Duchess of the Border Sea and trustee of the architect, 
the mouse, the rat might get a sore throat in a minute. Just warning you, he might go a little bit deeper. <laughs> oh, I see, said Leaf sarcastically. I beg your pardon? Leaf shook her head again. Never mind. Yeah, I suppose I am a mortal from Earth. A pretty dumb mortal. Yet you speak. I mean, dumb like stupid, said Leaf. Anyway, what do you want with a mortal from Earth? Can you help me get out of here? Monkton took a paper out of his coat pocket and held it out to Leaf. It was post-it note size when he handed it over, but as Leaf picked it up, it grew to full letter size. The paper showed an engraved portrait of a boy. It was quite a good likeness of Arthur. Underline, underneath were a few lines of type. Reward information as to the whereabouts of one Arthur Penhaligon, a mortal boy from Earth. Send particulars by telegram or message to Monday's Tears, Susie Turquoise Blue. Arthur, said Leaf, and Susie, Susie was the girl, the one with wings. Ah, said Monkton. You know Arthur. Do you know where he is? I might, said Leaf. Arthur could tell she was thinking from the way her eyes had narrowed a bit. Guess you want a reward. Naturally, said Monkton. Though in this case we have already been paid a small retainer. We are known to be expert searchers and finders. I'll tell you what I know if you help me escape and help me get in touch with Susie Blue. Hmm, said the rat. We can't help you escape as that would be counter to several agreements we have with various authorities within the house. However, <clears throat> I would be honoured to act as your counsel in the forthcoming court of inquiry into your criminal activities. Oh, don't make me read the court activities. Oh my goodness, I'll be squeaking forever. Criminal? What? What? The only thing I've done is let them drag me onto this ship. They took one look at me, asked my name, then threw me down here in chains. I believe that you'll be charged with being a stowaway, said Monkton, adding emphasis with a flick of his tail. The penalty is likely to be one or two hundred lashes, which I suspect you would not survive. Or, to be quite frank, being mortal, you would definitely not survive. Lashes? You mean whipping? Indeed. The Cat of Nine Tails. Perhaps you've heard of it. I don't want to hear about it, or feel it either. This is crazy. There must be something I can do. Mm. Depends on the court, said Monkton. I suppose there is a logical flaw in the charge, which, if correctly argued, would result in you being spared punishment. What is it? Monkton inclined his head a little to the side and looked at Leaf with one bright eye. We are mer mercantile rats, miss. <coughs> he said. That is to say, you can tell me what you know about Arthur, and I shall act as your counsel in the court. How do I know that you'll do anything for me once I tell you about Arthur? I give you my word as a raised rat and former mortal inhabitant of Earth, in the name of the piper who brought us here. Leaf looked at the rat carefully. He met her gaze and didn't blink. Okay, suppose I don't have much choice. You sound convincing, at least. Better than the guy who sold my dad his last car, anyway. I was visiting Arthur in his hospital room back on our... Back on Earth. Arthur had an invitation from Lady Wednesday to have lunch, and he was telling me about the house and everything. Then a giant wave came through the hospital room and swept us out to sea on Arthur's bed. We were getting washed up and down these really big waves when a ship with big green sails picked me up with a rope, but they missed Arthur. I guess he's still floating on his hospital bed somewhere, if it hasn't sunk or been picked up by someone else. All that good enough for you? It is an excellent lead, thank you. It also explains why the captain and crew of this vessel have been so tediously close-mouthed and have chosen to raft up here at the Triangle. Were it not for some of the regular rats, I would not even have known there was a mortal aboard. I suppose the Mantis was meant to pick up Arthur for Lady Wednesday, and having failed in their mission, Captain Swell is biding his time trying to work out what to do next. Besides, get rid of you, the unfortunate evidence of having picked up the wrong mortal. Raft up? Triangle? Where are we? We are aboard the Flying Mantis, in the Orlock deck, 
a ship of Wednesday's regular merchant marine. The mantis is rafted up, which is to say moored to another ship, which is moored to another ship, and so on. All of them ultimately joined to a giant triangular mooring post that is all that remains above sea level of the old Port Wednesday lighthouse, hence the triangle, which is, of course, in the border sea of the house. Which is the centre of the universe, said Leaf. At least that's what Arthur said. My parents would freak if they knew I was doing this. Beg your pardon? Uh, they think there's some big tree at the centre of the universe with little branches going off everywhere and animals living in harmony and being nice to each other and everything. Hmm, sounds rather pleasant. If only it was so. Now, I must be getting back to my ship. I shall stop off on the way and inform Captain Swell that I shall be your counsel. I imagine a court will sit any time within the next few days. The next few days? They haven't given me anything to eat or drink. I might starve or die of thirst. Not in the house. You may get hungry and thirsty, but you won't die. So you're just going to leave me here chained up, and that's it, to wait for the court or whatever? Yep, you have it exactly. Pleasure doing business with you. Goodbye. Wait! Shrieked Leaf. But the row, thank goodness, was gone. Arthur caught a flash of its tail as he left the mirror's field of view. Wait, you can't just leave me. What if the ship sinks? Leaf's shout was suddenly cut off and the mirror flickered between Leaf's situation and Arthur's face in the excuse me, in the lantern light. <clears throat> Arthur felt a wave of nausea at the sudden change of perception, but that was banished in an instant as Sunscorch clapped him on the shoulder and whispered, Arthur, get ready, lad, there's something coming in from the sea. Arthur blinked, stood up and hurriedly put the mirror and shell in the pockets of his dressing gown. That reminded him briefly that he needed to change into something more sensible. The thought only lasted for a second before it was gone. What's coming from the sea? Dunno. Lizard saw a light far off. I've seen it too. It's getting closer. Could be the shiver, though. Why they'd show a light, I don't know. Here, take this knife. Sunscorch had a cutlass in his belt, Arthur saw. He took the long knife the denizen offered him, still in its sheath. <laughs> and tried to fasten it with his dressing gown belt. Sunscorch shook his head. That won't serve. Come on back to the captain's tent. Ichabod can find you some decent slops. Slops? I'm not hungry. Particularly for something called Slops' clothes. Come on, we ain't got much time. The camp was quite different now, Arthur saw as he followed Sunscorch over to Caterpillar's tent. The denizens were all up and getting ready for a fight. They appeared more confident and better organised than they'd been at sea. Landlubbers whispered Sunscorch as they passed a group of denizens checking over their crossbows. They'll put up a better fight here than on any deck. Ichabod, help Lord Arthur into some ship-shaped clothes. Aye, aye, called Ichabod. He came over and gave Arthur a very low bow. Is there anything in particular my lord requires? Don't waste time. Give him whatever fits and be quick about it. I'm off to the guns, Arthur. Join me there when you're ready. Ichabod sniffed. Really, he has no idea the difficulties one has in maintaining a proper standard of dress. He looked Arthur up and down, walked around him, and wrote some figures down in a small notebook. Then he indicated the standing screen with the nautical pictures in the corner of the tent. Arthur had last seen it in Caterpillar's impossible room aboard the moth. If you would care to stand behind the screen, my lord, I shall endeavour to present a number of articles of attire that may approach some level of suitability for one of your most eminent position. Arthur went behind the screen. Almost immediately, Ichabod handed him a huge pile of clothes. Undergarments. Choice of three shirts. Collars. Choice of four. Neckties. Choice of six. Waistcoat. Choice of three. Breeches. Choice of three. Stockings. Choice of five. Shoes or boots, sir? Uh, I don't need any. My slippers are immaterial boots. Sea duty belt or ceremonial belt? Sea um, duty, I think. Ichabod continued to ask questions, handing Arthur an item of clothing or equipment every few seconds. Finally, he fell silent and Arthur quickly got undressed and put on his new clothes. Surprisingly, everything fitted him perfectly. Arthur hadn't deliberately chosen any particular combination, but when he was mostly dressed, he found that he had pretty much the same uniform as Caterpillar. A blue coat over a white shirt and blue waistcoat with white breeches. As Arthur had half expected, as soon as he changed clothes, his immaterial boots transformed from hospital slippers into knee-high boots, the left one wider in the leg to accommodate his crab armour cast. Arthur thought for a moment, then slipped the atlas and Wednesday's invitation down inside his right boot and the shell and mirror down the left boot. 
immaterial boots were proof against water as they were to almost everything and they would keep the articles safe and dry. I don't know what to do with this collar, Arthur said a few minutes later. The collar was separate from his shirt and he couldn't figure it out. Please allow me, said Ichabod. He quickly stepped in and fastened Arthur's collar. Before the boy could protest, Ichabod had wrapped a red cloth around his neck and tied it as a necktie as well. Arms up, sir, for the belt. A broad leather belt seemed to be the last thing to put on, but when it buckled up and Arthur tried to take a step out, Ichabod held his hand and held up his hand and gave a slight bow. Your sword, sir. One mustn't venture into a prospective battle without one sword. I suppose one mustn't, said Arthur. I'm even starting to sound like Caterpillar. I hope I don't turn into someone like him. I'd rather be like Sunscorch, someone who gets things done. Ichabod picked up a scabbarded sword from the floor and fastened it to Arthur's belt on his left hip. At the same time, Arthur tied the knife he'd been given by Sunscorch onto the other hip. This is a naval pattern sword, reduced in length and weight by the armourer specifically for your lordship, said Ichabod. He stood up and saw Sunscorch's knife, his mouth twisting a little in distaste. If I may say, my lord, the knife does little for the ensemble. Perhaps if you allow me, I want to keep the knife and I have to go and join Mr. Sunscorch now. Thanks for your help, Ichabod. I don't know how you got the clothes my size so quickly. Oh, I cut them down from the captain's and Mr. Concord's best whilst you were off with Dr. Scamandros, said Ichabod proudly. Then a few minor tweaks were all that was required. I have a very good eye, even if I say so myself. Always anticipate. That's the motto of the true gentleman's gentleman. Mm, thanks, muttered Arthur. He hoped Caterpillar and Concord wouldn't mind their best clothes getting cut down. Thanks again. And should your lordship be wounded in the forthcoming action, be assured that I have applied my motto to my other profession. What? Surgeon's mate. Or, as the extremely vulgar call it, lob lolly boy. I assist Dr. Scamandros. We've never had to operate upon a mortal, but I have all my equipment ready, knives, saws, drills, all newly sharpened. <laughs> Great, said Arthur, faking a cheerfulness he didn't feel. Well done. Keep up the good work. He hurried away before Ichabod had a chance to show him any newly sharpened surgeon's tools. He was halfway through the camp when he, to where the two cannons were pointing out to sea when he heard the sudden clang and clatter of the ship's bell and Sunscorch's bellow. Stand to your guns! Make ready your crossbows, cutlasses and board-in pikes to the tide mark! Who's coming? I don't know who's it going to be. So exciting. Thanks very much for listening. But if you're here for a little bit of waffle, here we are. I, I keep on saying it, it's getting closer and closer to lights on time. I've turned the lights on behind me. But, I mean, I could open the curtain, but then look, it's, it's too bright. It's too bright. What's going on? It's just this rubbish camera. Uh, anyway, so I think today is the very final day of the warm weather. It's, it's really sticky today. I wore my thickest shirt for work. Look. <laughs> really warm gosh but next week i spy that it is rain 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 great so um yeah hopefully it will make its mind up soon i don't know whether a dress for autumn dress for summer who knows who even knows but um yeah so hopefully with the with the rain it'll become a little bit cooler and then i know how to dress <laughs> um what else is happening this weekend yeah so like, as you know, the other night I went out with Blake and said my farewells. He's been at his mum's this week. So, yeah, so he's it, this is it. He's off. He's taken all of his stuff from his bedroom at my house. <laughs> and he's going. But the university he's going to, they only allow one, like, one parent, one car. So, yeah, so his mum's taking him, which I'm sad about. So um, maybe in a couple of weeks I'll go and visit him. So yeah, if I come and record my video tomorrow and I'm... <laughs> you'll know. <laughs> you'll know why. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's happening this weekend. Uh, what else is happening this weekend? Not a lot really. I haven't got anything exciting to report whatsoever. I'll try and think of something exciting to tell you tomorrow when I come in. Because at the moment, I ain't got nothing. All right. Okay. Love y'all lots. And I'll see you tomorrow for another.
bedtime story. Bye.